Hello, my name is Kelly Doyle Bailey, and thank you for joining me. This is SEL 101 Self Management for uh, Professional Development for Educators, Administrators, Support Staff, um, anybody who um, loves students, loves kids, big and small, and, um, and you're invested and committed to building your own emotional intelligence. Um, so much of what we're doing right now in schools is really helping kids to manage emotions and um, understand when big emotions are coming and what happens with the brain, right, when big emotions start to arise. So we know that when the brain goes offline, that it's, it's difficult for students and humans in general to really tap into that uh, prefrontal cortex. So in the SEL world, there are five competencies. If you've watched the first um, of this series, we already talked about our own self-awareness and developing our understanding of our thoughts and our emotions and how those um, emotions then drive our behavior and how mindful practices and strategies can help us to be more self-reflective and understanding of what we're doing and um, help us shape uh, where we're supposed to go. So this is the second part of the series. I'm going to share my screen with you and start the video here, the slideshow. So just thinking about our um, self-management from the very beginning. Whoops, this is not cooperating with me today. I'm just trying to move my icon here. So the beginning with the definition of self-management, this is really about our ability to navigate our own thoughts and our feelings and shifting away from unhealthy behaviors that may be blocking us from being available for healthy and responsive uh, communication and interactions and relationships, helping us to uh, be able to tap into our prefrontal cortex to manage um, and make responsible decisions. Um, and how we develop our self-management skills really begins with um, how we, um, who we had in our lives who were able to be um, a co-regulator for us because we're not born with the ability uh, innately just to regulate. We need to be regulated. Um, that's why babies are swaddled. That's why they're held. You know, we are, you know, we put them over our shoulder and we shush them and we rock them. So it's really about having a central nervous system that is integrated and feeling connected and safe um, within our environment. So that's how we can grow and develop and have resilience, grit, growth mindset. So, and that's how we um, can benefit one another and really build a healthy uh, human culture. So successful self-management really requires, like I just said, the ability to self-regulate. And this is the key um, to managing those um, disruptive emotions and impulses. And it really involves being grounded and present and centered and in charge of ourselves in responsive ways. But so much of what happens to us is we go into a reactive place. And I know this um, innately, you know, from, from my own sense that sometimes it's not easy for me to step away from a very big emotion and be reasonable or reflective about it. So it's about really understanding when I'm getting into that dysregulated place or when our students are getting into that dysregulated place and what kind of strategies and tools do we have to help shape that. So it really goes back to brain basics. Our prefrontal cortex must be online. Remember the Dr. Dan Siegel hand brain model. This is our prefrontal cortex. It lives right here behind our forehead. This is our executive functioning brain. It's where empathy and insight and responsivity, emotional regulation is housed. It's um, where we are really attuned to um, our communication and our ability to um, understand whether we are in danger. Um, to be able to look at environments. But if we're hyper vigilant and the thinking brain is offline, then the protecting brain or the guard dog, right? This is the part, the amygdala, the teeny tiny space that's right behind the prefrontal cortex that will react. And basically it is there, it's a built-in mechanism to keep us alive. And this amygdala does not understand the difference between a perceived threat or an actual threat. It will change the neurochemistry of our body um, in a blink of an eye and remember that we will go into that um, fight flight freeze pattern 
and the neurochemistry will support that in meaning that we will not have serotonin and dopamine and oxytocin readily available to us, but instead we will have the adrenaline and the norepinephrine and the cortisol. And this can hang out in our bodies for long periods of time. And so that's why stress management is so vitally important. And, you know, educators today are under a great deal of stress, especially with COVID-19 here and not knowing what's going to happen and how our schools are going to roll out. And so us building our own ability to recognize, number one, self-assess, what's happening with us, how am I feeling and where does that feeling live in my body? And then secondly, really tapping into what tools do I have and what strategies do I have in place where I can bring myself back to center and become reasonable. So this is really about having um, the willingness to tap into you know, your human emotion and not denying our emotions are there and then developing um, reliable senses of agency. So uh, we do not possess a healthy and reliable sense of agency with regard to our own emotional state when we are struggling and in strife. Um, and we can't recognize that in other people if we don't have agency over our own. So it's really critical, right, for adults to really master this skill set so that we then can develop agency. What I mean by that is confidence and optimism and an accurate self-perception, um, having compassion and understanding. It really begins with ourselves first. So there are six emotional competencies that I'm going to cover um, in this self-management um, piece. I guess I'll pop myself over here because I keep getting in the way. The first one is self-recognition of our own emotions. And we really talked about this earlier in the first series in self-awareness, but really this is the ability to recognize our own emotional map. And it helps to provide a real framework or, um, you know, just, just, yeah, a framework for understanding and recognizing the emotions of other human beings. We first have to know what's happening within ourselves. And know that our students can be triggered by our own emotions, those mirror neurons. If we're not taking care of our, ourselves and we're not in that just right place for teaching, whether we're in real time or remotely, um, then our, our kids will, students will pick up on that. So this skill set really requires the ability to carefully listen and to observe, to notice on purpose, really see yourself and one another, um, and really be able to open yourself up to seeing that um, humans from a diverse uh, background and, and, and different settings and cultures. Um, we must be present in our own lives so that we can then have an accurate perception of what's happening outside. So this takes a lot of practice and I haven't um, been able to yet, I'm still working on this skill set myself. The second one is emotional self-perception. And emotional self-perception really refers to our ability to tap into our emotional state through our accurate awareness. So if I am mired in a place of self-criticism, or if I'm attached to chaos, or I'm attached to um, perseverative looping stories, either stories that I've conjured up about myself, stories that I've heard about myself in my childhood, something that somebody has said along the way, and I choose, or for whatever reason, my psyche or my, um, sub, my subconscious has, has attached meaning to it, then I'm going to have a very skewed emotional self-perception. So one of the ways that we combat that is really to help gain a sense of self through, a, through harmony and through knowing and recognizing that we're human beings, not human doings. Again, human beings are allowed to make mistakes and we will, and not identifying with the mistake as that means I am a failure. So starting with seeing whatever emotion comes up, remember emotions will drive attention and our attention will drive our learning or responsivity to our learning. So for instance, if I'm feeling sad and I notice sadness, I can once I have the ability to be self-aware of my emotional roadmap, I can say, oh, I'm feeling sad. And this is what sadness feels like. And I feel that in my heart and I feel that in my eyes and I feel that in my chest and I feel that in my body, or this is what angry feels like. But then I can say to myself, I feel sad or I am feeling sad. I am not a sad person or I'm not an angry person. I remember working with, um, I believe he was a second grade student and he was, um, he vacillated in and out of 
big emotions a lot. And he had a lot going on in his little, in his little life. And when he learned that he can have agency over the emotions, um, it was like a whole new world opened up for him. And I remember him saying to me, Mrs. Bailey, I'm just angry. All my people are angry. We're just angry people. And when he started to really get a real good handle on flipping his lid and losing his cool and understanding about the neural structure of the, of the brain and how the amygdala is the uh, guard dog, and I can only react to that, something really magical happened for him. So he now says, I feel sad or I felt sad, and it just gives him agency over that. So this is really tricky. Um, it's it's hard to, it, it, it's something that we can we can easily say, but difficult to do. When we're calm and regulated, when we have a calm, grounded sense of ourselves, then our different systems of our nervous system are working. So when the sympathetic nervous system is working, we are dysregulated. Our body and our heart and our brain cannot work optimally. Our pupils dilate. We have uh, inhibition of our saliva. We can have big heart, just rapid heartbeat, um, dilated bronchi. Um, we can have our adrenals are producing things like um, cortisol and adrenaline and norepinephrine. And, and you know, we may have difficulty. We, we have to use the bathroom. Um, so there'll be this urgency about us. When the parasympathetic nervous system is activated, then all systems are just in that just right place. The heart, the brain, the body, the body are in congruence with one another, integrated, just right. But when the sympathetic nervous system is activated during flight, fight, flight, freeze, and you see this really easily with externalizers. These are our, the people in the world who really flip their lid at the drop of a hat and maybe push in their chairs or bang their, bang their hands or, you know, hands in the, in the hair or that sort of thing. Um, and you know they're the external sufferers, and then we have the internalizers, those those sweet internalizers who just you know anxiety amps up and they hold everything in, and maybe that when they get home in their safe place, then they flip their lid, then they lose it. So this is all really important for us to know because the body, the brain, the heart, the mind, everything needs to be in that congruent, just right, integrated place. Self control, impulse control. Can I control myself? Do I think before I speak? Do I think before I act? Are my emotions running high or low? Is my prefrontal cortex engaged or is my amygdala in charge? You know, the ability to pursue the important over the urgent rather than to always be controlled by impulsive or uncontrolled. Is my mind the boss of me or am I the boss of my mind? And it really it's, it happens when we start to slow systems down and we become comfortable with quiet. You know, um, sometimes in the past I have not felt right if I didn't feel wrong. If I'm mired in that chaotic environment and I only know go, 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 and I have this urgency about me, and then I have this sense of I don't have anything to do for a little bit, then I won't feel right because my body has become accustomed to the neurochemistry that supports urgent. And so when I'm quiet, then I don't feel right because my body's neurochemistry has really made me kind of addicted to that, to that high, high go. And that's why sometimes it takes people a few days to really relax when they go on vacation, because you're, we're so used to this automaticity of urgent lifestyle. Um, I think that's one of the things that, that I started noticing when I was consulting and collaborating with teachers across the state during COVID when we went into shutdown and everybody was in remote learning. Everybody was, was sad and, and having grieving processes and worrying. And, and then, you know, as we started moving forward into developing patterns of not really normalcy, but difference, differency, that's not even a word, but, you know, as we were starting to do different and just dealing with it, um, we didn't know what to do with the emotions. So it's really important for us to have, have a healthy idea of how to control our, our impulses. One of the ways that we can do that is through delaying gratification. And when we delay that gratification, it means that we can be okay and content where we are, that we're not always saying, I will be okay when it's recognizing that I'm always striving for something and, and trying to move into a place and, and, and just not thriving right where I'm at. And I'm just as guilty of that as, as anyone. Um, 
really being able to recognize that I'm okay right in this moment and that the things that I have right in this moment are good and enough. So helping to delay that gratification is a skill set that, especially if we um, embed this into our teaching with our students, it will help our dysregulated students to be able to trust that they're okay right this minute. Stress management, I mean, how many of us wish we could be the person in the hammock and just lounging by the ocean? Really, stress is, remember, one of the number one killers. It's in the top six of the things that, that kill us as human beings. And this skill set really requires the acknowledgement of stressors that are present in our lives. My stressors may not be the same as yours, but that all stress, if it's toxic and chronic and doesn't dissipate, throughout the day and it's always keeping us in that heightened fight, flight, freeze, hypervigilance, hyper alertness, then it's not good for our bodies. And so we have to make the conscious decision to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of each other and we can take care of, you know, the spaces and places that we are. One of the things that is so critical is self-care. And I know how many educators, including myself, roll their eyes when we talk about teacher self-care. You know, we are in a situation right now where we can afford to take care of ourselves. We, if you are working remotely like I am, you can take the time to get a drink of water, use the bathroom, to listen to the signals of your body when you're hungry, to go to bed and get up at, you know, at reasonable times. This is not selfish. It is really the most selfless thing that you can do because our self-preservation and making sure that we're calm and centered and grounded is what our students are going to require. They need it, especially our dysregulated students. So spending time on our own stress management through self-care is crucial. So coping is another one of the strategies and really this is about emotional regulation skills that help us adapt and respond to when we are anxious and worried and afraid. It's making sure that we take time to seek support, whether from it's from, whether this is from our family or a physician, a mental health specialist, when life stressors get too big and too much for us to handle. Um, and not really, you know, making sure we're not turning into or tuning into those maladaptive coping mechanisms where we're doing the blame shame thing or blaming other people, not being accountable for what we say, withdrawing, denying, moving into depression or despair, or, you know, using substances. This is where hope and love and courage and resilience and determination come into play. And the number one factor of resilience is hope. And without hope, again, it sounds very cliche, but we're hopeless. We, if we don't have something to hope for, and we're not, we're not just trying to get to that place, but we have hope in our in ourselves, then we can build the networks inside of our brain to be resilient. So spend some time with hope. Check your stress. I've included in this webinar and in, in the resource that uh, you can uh, click on this. Um, and you can take a stress test. Um, it was very uh, eye-opening to me because I thought, okay, I do, you know, Kundalini yoga and I do this yoga and I walk and I drink water and I exercise and I try, but it's very interesting, the layers of stress. So take the moment to do this stress test with, um, wow. Okay, I guess this is gonna show you a little bit of the stress test, but I don't wanna take time with that, so. We're gonna move that away. All right, hopefully you can still see this. So what does self-talk look like? Um, I wanna to talk to you about be care being careful about how we talk to ourselves because as this person, Lisa M. Hayes is saying, be careful how you talk to yourself because you are always listening. What is it that we say to ourselves? What do you say when you look in the mirror and you look at yourself? What kind of, um, what kind of self-talk is taking up space or in your mind? Part of your self-management competency and building that emotional, uh, emotional piece to ourselves is to think intentionally about how present I am and kind I am to myself. So can I allow mistakes to be teachers or do I look at mistakes as opportunities to um, fulfill this, this doubt that I already had about myself? So thinking about the self-talk, it's super critical. 
And this is about intentional, intentionality of our language. So the power of our own words, really. Negative self-talk or positive self-talk? Do I say I'm not good at anything or do I say I'm still learning? Do I say, you know, I just don't have the resources for that? Um, or do I say necessity is the mother of all invention? I'm too lazy to get this done. Hey, I wasn't able to get that done yet, but I'm going to make some time to do that tomorrow. There's no way this is gonna work out. Hey, I'm gonna give this another shot. I'm gonna give this another go. I'm gonna look at it from a different perspective. You can kind of see the power of words, choice words, um, intentional, intentional speaking. So that's something that, um, that really helps us develop really good self-management skills. We talk about mindfulness in the first um, SEL 101 for self-awareness. Mindfulness, there are mindful practices that are very, very um, useful when we're developing our self-management skills as well. So when we think about mindfulness, cultivating mindfulness, um, we think about it as a tool or a strategy to help us as human beings be more present in our lives calming our body, our heart, and our brain, really for optimal health and well-being, allowing ourselves as human to become more self-reflective and in control of our emotions rather than allowing our emotions to control us. Um, it is not a substitute for mental health. Real mental health crisis requires su support. Please do not feel that I am saying that mindfulness is going to be the, the, the catalyst for health for 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 your anybody's um serious mental health issues so it is just a tool that we can utilize but it really is critical for humanity it's critical for a peace of mind and a presence of mind it helps cultivate caring and empathy and compassion first for ourselves and then for others and it really helps us to be able to look at humanity across multiple um cultures and and climates and, and races and just looking at it through a lens of equity helps us to to become more human and just to see that we are able to put ourselves in other people's shoes or th at least think about what it might be like so if i can't manage my emotions and my emotions are always managing me i'm going to be defensive and i'm going to withdraw and i'm not going to be able to get perspective or have conversations about things so one mindful practice that I have that you could, um, you could work on is naming your emotion. Again, we talked about those mirror neurons um, are, are great tools. And, and we just to know if I'm geared up and I'm running high and I run through my home and I turn that home upside down by being frustrated because I see a sink full of dishes when the family is you know, chilling in the living room at the end of the day and I blow up and lose my cool because that's all I see and I choose not to see the people that I love just being together and supporting one another, then I am going to up, I'm going to turn a situation where my family is calm and, and being together and, and, and settling into an uproar situation where I am dysregulating everybody. So before I walk through the door, I have to ask myself purposefully, especially if I've had a long day, how am I feeling? What am I going to bring to this family? How am I going to walk through the door? And am I going to add to the, the harmony of my family or am I going to take away from it? So as educators, it's really critical that we really tap into practicing naming our emotions and not getting on that, that hamster wheel of go, 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 go. So whether you're in real time or on a remote learning platform, you know, just make sure before you turn on that Zoom or before you go pick your students up from art or before, you know, they come back from lunch that you do your own work for just a second and ask yourself, am I ready? What do I need? Do I need to take three slow deep breaths? So this week, the mindful practice is about being in charge of our emotions and just really looking at what, what is lying beneath the surface. And we do this through investigation of curiosity. What is the root emotion? What might it be? Am I angry or am I afraid? Am I bored or sad? Am I lonely? Do I feel shame? Am I feeling disgust or regret, fear, concern? What is it? What is it? Unpacking it and really sitting with it for a second with investigation and curiosity rather than 
lid flipping, danger, you know, amygdala reaction. One of the things that we can do is really practice gratitude for our emotions. So when, when we feel an emotion come about, um, whoops, when we feel an emotion coming about, we can be grateful for the emotion regardless of what it is. So for example, we can, if we notice that we're feeling sad, we can practice first noticing that we're sad. Remember saying, okay, this is what sad feels like. I feel tears in my eyes. My eyes feel irritated. They feel um, tingly. I, I can't breathe very well. My heart is pounding. Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm feeling as though I'm, I'm pulling away. And then taking a moment in gratitude and thanking the emotion for being there. So we would say, thank you, sadness. Thank you for showing up today. You've helped me understand and appreciate what it feels like when I experience joy. And without you, I would never know what joy, true joy feels like. And there's something about embracing an emotion. And I am not trying to minimize or dismiss emotions. I'm just saying that emotions are fleeting. Feelings are fleeting and they are dependent upon the situation, the information, the crisis that is present for us in any one time. And of course, big situations like leaving kids from a, a classroom and not being able to go back. I mean, we're, we get mired in, in that grief or losing a loved one, losing a pet, losing a job, um, life turning upside down, an illness, can, you know, finding out that we have an illness or a loved one has an illness. I mean, those are huge, huge emotions. But staying stuck in an emotion that can not really serve us in any good way doesn't help us to to continue to thrive as human beings so remember it's okay to have emotions and all emotions are okay but what's not okay is to be ruled by the emotions or let them stick around longer than necessary or for them to be there when they don't serve us in any good way so ha just having a healthy relationship and understanding of our emotions one of the strategies that we can do is called RAIN. RAIN stands for recognize, allow, investigate, and non-identity. So when we recognize an emotion that comes up, we have a conscious acknowledgement of our feelings and our thoughts. Again, we name the emotion, sadness. And then the second part of RAIN is A, allow. And this just allows us to let the emotions, thoughts, or feelings, or sensations just simply be there without trying to figure them out. Sometimes what emotions will surface and we don't know where they're coming from. We can be triggered by something that someone says or does. Um, so simply allow that emotion to be there. And when we're allowing, we're really essentially taking control of the emotion and the neurochemistry that is attached to the emotion. The third part of RAIN is called investigate. When we look at our emotions with kindness and self-compassion, calling upon them with curiosity and interest, saying self what are you feeling right now what's happening right now and just recognizing that it's there investigating it for just the simplicity that it is not the why but just the what what am i experiencing right now helps us to have agency or empowerment over the emotion and then the last piece is the most critical piece really recognizing it the bookends of this recognizing the emotion and then non-identification with the emotion are the two most critical components of rain because we are so much more than the sum of our emotions and we are so much more than the stories or the lies um, that we've listened to or told ourselves. So when we don't identify with it as, as who we are, but it's an experience that the human heart or body or mind is, is, is feeling, then we can, we can have agency over it. So RAIN, that's another mindful practice. Self-reflection, uh, practicing RAIN with our students. Um, when we do this, when we do have a, a when we, we can take a second and just notice an emotion that comes up, ask ourselves which part of RAIN was most useful, um, which one wasn't, uh, what point did I notice any relief from the situation? And then um, you can just share RAIN 
with your family, your students, um, and your friends. It's just a really great practice and it's a simple one and you can just remember it rain. And sometimes I had a student once tell me, Mrs. Bailey, I was able to practice the, the rain mindful strategy when it rained because it made me really angry that it was raining and I didn't get to play my baseball game. And so that's what this human being did, recognized, allowed, investigated, and then became you know, non-attached non to it. The mindful practice of a body scan is really setting us out aside time to play uh, at the end or the beginning of our day to really um, just be present with the body and allowing relaxation so so that we don't get to find a place where we won't be you won't be disturbed um, or distracted in any way you can do this lying down or sitting you work from your toes to the crown of your head noticing each part of the body and where any tension or um, tightness and allow for softening. I have put here, um, I put together a body scan uh, mindful practice. If um, some of you have been with me during the, the breaks, the brain breaks um, throughout the past five months, you know that um, I always start with that. And I think this would just be a really good way for us to just take a break right now. So the invitation is really for you to sit back and allow your body to just feel completely solid. Feel your feet anchoring yourself to the floor. Notice that your body is being supported by the chair. And just for a few seconds, engage in purposeful, mindful breathing. Remember from our SEL 101 self-awareness that mindful breathing is the first practice in our self-awareness, in our toolbox of mindfulness without trying to control the breathing in any way, just breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. Slow, deep breaths, noticing the rise and fall of your heart and your stomach. Allowing yourself just to simply be in this place of presence. Closing your eyes if that's comfortable for you or softening your gaze. And just in the moment of groundedness, notice everything. Notice things that you hear. If your eyes are closed or open, just notice what you see or sense that you see. Colors, shapes. Keep breathing and notice things that you smell. Keep breathing in through your nose and out through your mouth and notice things that you feel. Feet on the floor. Points of contact with the chair. Jewelry sitting on your body small sensations of the body, hair on your forehead. And lastly, notice anything that you taste or enjoy tasting. Before we begin the body scan, just notice simply your mind. Whether you're in a mind wandering, remember the tool or the, the, the work of the mind really is to wander. It's not anything that is abnormal, it's very usual. Brain science says 47% of the time that we're awake, we're engaged in a memory, having a thought or making a plan. So for the next few seconds, and I'll keep track of the time, just continue to breathe in through your nose and out through your mouth. And just practicing the anchoring skill set we learned last time. As you breathe and feeling calm, if a memory surfaces or a thought surfaces, or you catch yourself making a plan, just use an anchor word like breath or hear and bring yourself back 
just to the breathing. And it's okay if you have to do this over and over and over again. It doesn't matter. Now just bring yourself back to your feet and feeling yourself anchored in place. Notice your toes. Bring your awareness to your ankles. And then rest upon your knees. Loosen and allow your legs from the calves to the toes just to become soft and heavy. Continuing to breathe. Bring your awareness from your knees to your hips and allow all areas from the hips to the toes to become soft and heavy, engaged in purposeful awareness, breathing, allowing the lower half to be heavy, center on the core or the belly. Some people like to put one hand on their belly and one hand on their heart. And just notice the soft expansion, the rise and fall of your belly and your lungs. Breathing in, the belly and the lungs expand. Breathing out, slow and long, the belly contracts, the lungs contract, the chest walls contract. And notice just for a second in the body scan practice, the legs are heavy, toes are grounded but soft. What is the belly saying? Notice if your belly is hungry, discontent, irritable, or calm. And notice just like rain, how that feels. Allow it, acknowledge it, investigate it. With curiosity and interest, remember non-judgment. Moving away from the core, the belly, move to the heart center. Feel the rhythm, the unique beating of your own heart. Notice on purpose with gratitude that your heart is beating and keeping you alive. And that you may not have even realized or recognized or had any acknowledgement about the work of the heart until we placed that notion in our mind. The heart is beating, working in congruence with all other systems of our body to keep us alive. And deeper still inside the heart center dwells the loving kindness, first for ourselves and then for others. Thinking on purpose, may I be well. May I be safe in this moment, the small moment I've carved out for myself. May I be healthy and happy and free of all pain and suffering. May my heart be filled with great joy, deep compassion for myself, forgiveness and understanding that I am doing my best. I am enough. Just breathing that loving kindness into your own body and heart. Later, we'll do more loving kindness where we extend this to humanity. But just for this practice, we sit in self, practicing self-awareness, practicing self-management, practicing being calm and grounded and okay. Releasing the heart center and moving to your shoulders, releasing any tension in your shoulders, letting them become long. Arms are by your side, palms can be up or down, and release each finger like the flowers outside in the morning as the petals unfurl. 
uncurl, open to the possibility of the day. The body is getting very heavy from the neck all the way to the toes, like a rag doll. Notice your neck and your jaw. Allow space between your top teeth and your bottom teeth. Loosen and soften the tongue. Let it drop from the top of your mouth. Allow the stress of the face to just release the muscles around your eyes and your cheeks, your eyebrows and your forehead. And as you go to the top of your head or the crown, just hover your awareness just at the top, right above the hairline. And gently give a nod of gratitude for your beautiful brain and the hard work that the body and the mind and the heart and the brain do each and every day. The emotions that come and go, our reactions and our responses to work and life, school, family, commitments, finances. Just thank the body and the mind and the heart for taking care of us. And gently sweep your awareness from the top of your head all the way through the body, back down through the belly, all the way to the tips of the toes and resting back at the heart center, one hand on your belly, one hand on your heart. Three slow, deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. In through your nose, out through your mouth. Last one, in through your nose, out through your mouth. Gently bring your awareness back to this physical space by wiggling your toes, rolling your wrists, stretching, giving an energy on. Blinking your eyes, gently bringing yourself back. And that's called a body scan. There are many, many, many beautiful body scans on YouTube. If you like the self-guided ones, you can uh, tap into the one that I did for the Department of Education. And you can also do one for yourself. Just remember to start from the feet and move to the head. The reason that we do that is really neurological because we don't come out of the womb walking and talking and chewing gum. We come out of the womb and we figure out where we are. And we start by the vestibular system of moving side to side. And when we're rocked, that balance center gets stimulated in our inner ear and our, our whole vestibular system begins to organize. And then we start rolling side to side on our own as we, do, as we figure out our body and we notice our fingers and our toes. And then we get up on our hands and knees and we rock forward and back and flop back down on our, our belly as we figure out the body. And we learn to walk before we run. So we start from the ground up. And that's also optimal in how we teach our students. If we are not integrated in our body, if our bodies don't cross midline, if we can't do jumping jacks and cross crawls, if we don't spend some time with integrating big muscles, then the little muscles of the eyes, the thinking muscles of the ears, the writing muscles of the fingers won't be as organized. So start with the ground up and honor from the feet to the crown. Spend a little time in your heart center too. So mindful grounding. Um, this is a practice that we did. So the grounding piece was really using all five senses. And that's what the thing that we did with our feet and then noticing everything. So the mindful grounding, there's a, a practice that you can do. There's a self-guided practice you can do there. And then I gave you a mindful gratitude practice um, that you could do. It's a beautiful uh, listening practice for uh, being grateful for the things in our lives. And then there is a compassion one. Um, Self-compassion is something that we must dearly practice. It is not something that is innate and um, not a lot of us are able to do that. Not holding ourselves so accountable for every single thing we've said or done in a place of not knowing. Letting ourselves off the hook, learning from the mistakes and not letting the mistakes be our, the thing that identify 
us as human beings. So my, my wish, my hope for you, my mindful intention for you is that you will share your self-management knowledge and practices with people you love. When we take the time to develop our own emotional intelligence skills um, and practice them and share them with others, then we are growing in decency about ourselves. And then we are able to help shape the future of tomorrow to be a peaceful, productive humanity, uh, a planet that is well grounded in, in, in safety and connection and love and respect. I think that's our job as educators and our jobs as humans is to do everything we can to be good people. So here are some resources for you. I hope that this has been a good um, tutorial in emotional self-management. Again, remember mindfulness is a catalyst or a tool to help us be calm, to control our impulses, to, uh, to deal with our stress. Um, may you all be well, safe, healthy, and happy. Thank you so much for taking the time to um, listen to this, to this um, recording, and I will see you next time. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.